Yes, we're here. Remember, stay home, stay safe, stay healthy. And uh, we're always going to be here with you. Chris Sheeran, Jim Spinarkle, coming to you from my former stomping grounds. That would be the great state of New Jersey. Jim, hey. glad to see your face and glad to hear your voice, my brother. Well, I am uh, happy to see you too, Chris. And I am in the state of New Jersey where I live. So uh, it's good to have you back in the state. The great news we can report, Jim, is that all four Nets players that did test positive for COVID-19 have been clear they are symptom-free. That is awesome news. Yeah, that, that's great news, I think, Chris, in two perspectives, really. Number one, obviously, for the players, and maybe it's three uh, points that I could make on that. The players, obviously, with their individual health, great from a team standpoint that nobody else appears to have it, right? So that's the question of the unknown. And I think it's also kind of a positive for people who are obviously clearly paying attention to what's going on with this virus, that guys can get it like Kevin Durant and the other three. And then all of a sudden, in a relatively short period of time, they can announce that they're healthy again. So I think there's three points right there. The last one being really a societal type of issue where, you know, there's some, you know, some good, strong light at the end of the tunnel, hopefully. Yeah, we hear the scary stuff all the time, Jim. It's nice to see yeah. some positive news. Right on the front as well. That's a great point on your part. And uh, let, let's talk a little Nets basketball. Let's revive it a little bit here because, you know, before the season came to a halt, there were some positive things going on with the Brooklyn Nets. And one of those, Jim, it's something we talked about ad nauseum on the pregame shows and on the postgame shows. And, and I'll lead it to you with this. Back on February 1st, I remember it very vividly. The Nets lost to the Wizards. Bradley Beal went off in the fourth yep. quarter. No shock there. But Karis LeVert, I remember Frank Isola was in studio with me that night, and we both pondered the question in the postgame, wow, he just doesn't look like he has his first step, or any step for that matter. We talked to Sarah Kustak in the postgame about it too, and she echoed our sentiment. And then, of course, right after that game, Jim, he starts to go absolutely off, and there was no coincidence Kenny Atkinson at the time, the head coach, put him into the starting line off and he just uh, line up and he just began to take off. Yeah, it, it's true. And it's it's one of those things where, you know, as as players develop throughout the course of the season, I think, and this has been like a fragmented season for the Nets with the injuries, guys coming and going and, and trying to restart the engines, if you will, with the guys on the floor, maybe some tweaks in the starting lineup. But that I think happens a lot of times, Chris, where guys start to get their legs to sort of get their confidence and all of a sudden they can explode into a different type of player throughout the same season. And, and Karras is one of those guys because he had a stop and start last year and now he had a stop and start this season uh, and, and questions of health start going over his head. But he really started to come into his own. He's grown every year, Jim, exponentially. It's just yeah. been staying on the floor. But what was it about him this season that really caught your eye, especially over those last few games where he was in the starting lineup? I think it was the, the culmination of his, his confidence picking up in terms of knowing and recognizing that when I'm healthy, him speaking type of thing, I know I can do X on the floor. And I think there are times with any player, Chris, when you think about it, if you're second guessing yourself or in the back of your mind, you're not as confident in either your body being physically capable of, of doing what you want or mentally you're hesitating because my shot's not falling. I'm not playing real well. Those things can be a drag. And unfortunately, when you're playing against the best guys in the world, if one or two of those things or both of those things are affecting you, then you're not going to be the same player as when you see those two things working in your favor. And I think the two of those things came together for Karras. I think the confidence part of it, he just started to accentuate his good thinking about what he can do. And clearly, I mean, this is not, you know, headline breaking news right here. He's a very, very talented player. And I also think that, you know, with the way he plays and the talent that he has, he's a tough guy to defend because there's no routine rhyme and reason to what he's doing. Each and every play, it seems like he does different things. You know, if you think about players on the floor with the Nets or any other players, and Kyrie Irving's maybe a little bit like him too. Kyrie throws a flash, a different type of flash constantly at you. That's why he's difficult to guard. But if you look at certain players on the league in the league, and I think Joe Harris is a good example of this of a guy who's grown. Joe came in. Uh, struggled at first, but he's a shooter. He's a shooter. That's all Joe can do, right? So now you start defending him. But what Joe, Joe Harris is just wow. not a shooter. 
Right, he's evolved, and he's, now he throws a different dimension at him. So I think Joe Harris has become a, a very, very good all-around player. So he's broken out of what people had him in that frame and that box of being just a shooter. And I think Harris, in a, in a different type of way, he didn't have the shooter's reputation like Joe did, but he had a great all-around game, and now he's throwing different flavors into it. And I just think, you know, let's put it this way, I wouldn't want to guard him on a night-by-night basis. It's just like Kyrie, you don't know where it's coming from. Well, here's, here's a point I want to see if you, you agree with me here, but we saw the evolution of Karis LeVert the past couple of seasons since he was drafted. Right. But I think, I think it's been a huge positive, Jim. And look, I'm not, I'm not going out on a weak branch here. But <laughs> you never do. You have, <laughs> when, you have, when you have Kevin Durant sitting on the bench and watching you on a nightly basis and in your ear on a nightly basis and pushing you, on a nightly basis, not accepting anything less than what Karis LeVert can bring to the table full tilt, that's got to be an added factor to him this season as well. I would agree with you on that to a degree because I think, in fact, that that does help. I think coaching helps. I think your teammates help. All trying to put positive thoughts in your mind. And obviously, when you have an MVP quality player like Kevin Durant doing that for you, yes, that's going to help in terms of learning that learning curve and picking up different things. The bottom line, though, where I sway just a little bit, Chris, is at the end of the day, it has to be Karis LeVert or it has to be Joe Harris or whatever individual player you're talking about to be able to take those things, take the tips, put them in a good uh, mindset, process them, and then go out and execute with them. So, yes, it does help to have all these positive vibes and the Nets and the organization, the coaching staff. That's why you, you hear them talking so much about culture, to build culture, build good culture, build good vibes around the organization. So what that does in my mind, it, it takes any player and says, okay, I don't have to really worry about too much that's going on outside of what I'm supposed to do in terms of how I fit in with this team. Let Sean Marks worry about the culture and the players and the, and the, the new players coming in. Let the coach do the coaching. Let the assistant coaches, let everybody do their job. What's my job as a player? To take all those benefits and get better as a player for this team and quite candidly as an individual. And Spencer Dinwiddie's another one of those guys, Jim. This year, it was basically the Spencer Dinwiddie show until the season came to a halt. Yeah, and keep in mind, too, when he was in college, he was hurt late, late in his career. So, obviously, he gets a slowdown there and actually was a very good college basketball player, which not a whole lot of people focus on. And now, all of a sudden, he, he kind of hits some bumps in the road. So, I'm sure he went through that mental up and down in terms of, physically starting there again am I physically capable of reaching what I want to reach in terms of how good I can be then he gets healthy and then all of a sudden his mind has to take over and now that combination starts to play into it and yeah I mean he's just taking you know a leadership role on the floor um, I think he's made you know you know the game winning shots we've seen him but I think more importantly is that ability of being able to want to take that game ending shot is a very very important concept that I, I think goes under noticed a lot and I think Spencer has that does he make decisions that are great all the time at the end of games no but it's a learning curve and, and you want somebody in a position that you know to make it and to be positive and to be successful with it you have to have failure you know nobody comes into that league especially and says okay I got 10 game winning shot opportunities I just nailed 10 out of 10 it doesn't happen because these guys even though people say the NBA guys don't play defense. I always turn around and say, oh, yeah, try to get your shot off on them. Because I tried to get my shot off on them, <laughs> and they know how to defend. <laughs> before we go, I want to bring up the picture behind you. Now, before we started taping, uh, we kind of took a guess at what that was, and our producer got it right, Eric Roldan. But why don't you tell everybody what that picture is above your head there? You see this picture over my right shoulder here? Yeah is a framed picture, a limited edition, of a picture of a White Castle restaurant. <laughs> Need I say anything more? Why? Why in the world do you have a framed, limited edition picture of White Castle in your house? Well, Please. it goes back years and years ago, Chris, with our family. Once in a blue moon, my wife's family would all get together and, and go crazy and go order for 30 people. There's nothing like it, too, when you go to a White Castle and you order for 30 oh, people. 30 pack? Of course. Well, no, not a 30 pack because okay. we would get, we'd get, my brother-in-law, this is a true story, my brother-in-law, we, we went to the White Castle one day to, to buy White Castles for, you know, 30 people that were back in the house. So we went to, to go get the, uh, the order. So we walk in and we ordered 
I'm just making up the order now, but it was something like this, 25 cheeseburgers, 30 hamburgers, 25 french fries, onion rings, blah, blah, blah. So we had this huge, humongous order. And the, the person who was taking the order looked at my brother-in-law, who's a big guy like me, and says, is that to go or is that to stay? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we're, going to, we're going to eat 70 hamburgers by ourselves. Oh, my right? God. So they got that as a Christmas present for me. So it's, it's one of those things. There's no, other than that crazy story, no real rhyme or reason to that either. So coming to a theater near you soon, Spinarkle and Kumar go to White Castle. I can't. <laughs> That's <think> true. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Jim, we appreciate the time. I uh, hope your family stays safe. Uh, everybody out there, we hope you stay safe, stay healthy, and just remember, yes, we're here for Jim Spinarkle. I'm Chris Sheeran. We'll see you next time, everybody.